And it's wonderful to be able to put a face to that voice. And um, a great pleasure in introducing David Hooks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roger. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely, the invitation from the Molands Historical and Peninsula Association to be here because it's got me into this building. And I'm one of those who've driven past it on so many occasions and thought, thank goodness it was saved. The people power prevented the demolition of this building. I know they started, Roger's given me some information, and they started, but um, it's still here, and what a magnificent building it is. I love Perth, but the demolition mentality of Perth gets me down. A bulldozer waiting in every lane. I was in Adelaide last year for the funeral of a very, very dear friend, and realised that Adelaide, while having some new buildings, has kept it's old ones, and that's good, so many of them. I'd like to start with a prayer for the middle-aged, which some of us are approaching. <laughs> I didn't say from which direction, did I? <laughs> Lord, thou knowest better than I know myself that I am growing older and will someday be old. Keep me from the fatal habit of thinking I must say something on every subject on every occasion. <laughs> Release me from craving to straighten out everybody's affairs. Make me helpful but not bossy, thoughtful but not moody. With my vast store of wisdom, it seems a pity not to use it all. But thou knowest, Lord, that I want a few friends at the end. <laughs> And I love the way that concludes. Lord, give me the ability to see good things in unexpected places and talents in unexpected people. And give me, Lord, the grace to tell them so. I love it. Written 400 years ago by a nun. What a wise woman she was. So to my bit of history now, I was starting to write a book as a memoir for some of my grandchildren to know what their granddad had done with his life. And as I was writing, I thought, I've got some sound for that. I've got some audio for that. I've got some of that. And I discovered I had a quite remarkable and unexpected audio archive. And so the memoir was put aside and the three compact disc set came into being, Surviving on Air. Valerie already has a coffee blesser, and that's there. And in it, there are so many people that I've been privileged to meet and interview and talk to over my 48 years in radio and television. It began on the 13th of June, 1955, in the town of Taree, on the mid-north coast of New South Wales, on the mighty Manning River. My career ended on the 23rd of June 2003 in the fair city of Perth on the banks of the mighty Swan River. And so many things happened to me in that 48 years. I knew from the age of six that I was going to be a radio announcer. And my darling mother, of whom I'll tell you a bit more later, encouraged her boy to listen to the radio, to gather. Well, she knew I needed some memories for the Maylands Historical and Peninsula Association. <laughs> so there I was collecting them from a very early age indeed. I want to share some of the sounds I've heard. Let's see, first of all, if you can hear this. This is a test to see if you can hear in various parts of the room. Later on, we don't want anyone at the back complaining that they missed out. Most of all those at the front complaining that it was too loud. So this is just a little exercise that is at that stage of my lips reading during this to see whether you can hear up there, over there, and how is it down here? Comfortable? Excellent. Thank you for your cooperation. Well, we're doing very well so far. <laughs> so there I am listening to the radio. Mum let me eat every evening meal in front of the radio. 
holes being worn in the feltex where my arms rested while cutting up the meat and veg, listening. I loved everything about the f programs I heard. I loved the themes that introduced them. I loved the content of the programs. I liked the announcers' voices. I even enjoyed some of the commercials, the advertisements, the ones that were clever, the ones that were catchy, and things like that. Okay, let's see if you have any of these in your memory bank. Go. Do you remember some of those? Yeah. You don't? Uh, well, yeah. I do. <laughs> and the Search for the Golden Boomerang was in there. Yes, what was in there? Superman, Kindergarten of the Air. They're just some of those that I was sharing with you. My mother, who was the breadwinner, fell ill. You see, Mum was widowed when I was ten days old. My father was out helping a man muster some sheep at Canamble on the mighty Castlereagh River in the northwest of New South Wales where I was born. Dad got soaked, it was just enough then to kill him. Pneumonia was a fatal disease in 1938. So there was Mum with six of us, Bill 15, Peggy 12, Douglas 10, the twins Jean and Bobby 5 and 10 days old David. So when I fell ill, or she fell ill, I had to leave school at the age of 15, having done my intermediate certificate. Job, had to pay board and all that help, so I got a job in a bank. Very exciting. <laughs> Any bank johnnies? Okay. Well, I don't mean to be offensive, but it wasn't where I wanted to be. The excitement came when I saw a job advertised in the Sydney Morning Herald for a junior announcer at 2RE. Into the city I ran and recorded an audition on what we called an acetate disc. So there I am. And I prepared material for it, including some advertisements. I wrote one. Would you like a bottle of sunshine? Golden Circle Pineapple Juice. It's bottle sunshine. And they liked that. And then I wrote some more. And then I wrote some news items or stole some from the paper. Then did some music announcements talking about Crosby, Sinatra, Joe Stafford, Gordon McRae, some of the people who were so good at that time. And then I, with a little help from the people at the church that I attended, St Thomas's North Sydney, where I was a choir boy until my voice let me down, that I was a choir boy. And so I asked them and they gave me their clues. So I finished my audition and the orchestra played the intermezzo from Cavalleria Rusticana by Mascagni. I reckon that got me the job. I think they thought up there at Tari, if he can say that, he's going to be all right. <laughs> and so I got the job, resigned from the bank, packed some clothes, my mates came around to say goodbye with bottles of Shelley's lemonade and Marchant's cola. No one drank alcohol at the age of 17, in the, well, no one I knew anyway drank alcohol at 17, and off I went to Tari and they booked me into Mrs. Cox's boarding house in Florence Street. I bought a bicycle and rode to the studios to do the late afternoon program. I was also responsible for choosing the music for the evening announcer who presented the hit parade. You surely remember the hit parade. Sunday nights at half past six. There it was. <laughs> Australia Airlines present the eight top tunes of the week in the TAA Hit Parade. <laughs> Johnny 
when TAA will present the Hip Parade, Trans Australia Airline, the friendly way, or fly Ansett and chance it, <laughs> <laughs> which we didn't say on the radio. <laughs> so one night, I, for variety, I went to the library and I chose the Hip Parade for the evening bloke and put in, they were all 12, uh, sorry, 10 inch 78s, the 45 hadn't arrived yet, and I put in one by Les Welsh and his band, who'd had a big hit with a man called Peter, you might remember. Anyway, Australian group, and I put that in, and Leon looked at it and went straight to the record library and found Bill Haley and played the right version of Rock Around the Clock. It wasn't long before I needed a motor car because the breakfast announcer had decided he wanted to be a bookmaker. There was more money at the horses than there was where I and he worked. So they said, David, you're the breakfast announcer from next month. Oh, so I didn't think the bicycle at five o'clock in the morning was such a good look across the dairy flats of Taree. So I bought my first motor car, a 1927 Oakland, canvas hood, perspex windows, and a crank handle. And I very quickly found out where your thumb goes on a crank handle. Fortunately, I didn't find out through experience. I found out through someone telling me and me having the good sense to listen to the advice that I got. Anyway, that was my first motor car and I needed a license. I went from a test. I passed and the car failed. <laughs> it pulled to the right when the brakes were applied. Get the car fixed, David. You've passed your driver's license, said the kindly police officer. And so that was the start of driving. After a time, I got a phone call, and my name is McCormack, said the man. I manage 4BU Bundaberg. For one reason or another, we've been listening to you, and we'd like you to come and do our breakfast program. Oh, 18-year-old kids react immediately to things like that. So I went home to Sydney, packed some more clothes, said goodbye to Mum and my brothers and sisters, flew to Brisbane, and then travelled by road to Bundaberg on the mighty Burnett River and uh, began four very happy years in Bundy. I loved it there. It was a very happy time. And uh, I went dancing three nights a week and the girls would say, David, your hands are so soft. And I'd say, yes, I wonder why. And they'd say, because you're not a cane cutter. You don't handle those big knives cutting cane. On Sunday nights, I went down to the little beachside suburb of Bundaberg called Bagara, where there was a roller skating rink. And I couldn't roller skate, so there was a girl on that side and a girl on that side, and they taught me to roller skate. You wouldn't believe what a slow learner I was. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. It was good. What did I sound like in those days? Not a bad question. I'll let you have a little listen. Speaking your entry yet for the legacy of secret sound, your two shilling entry will bring to you a week's holiday in Brisbane for two, with all expenses paid, including free air travel, free accommodation, seeing tours, theatre seats, and other entertainment. Yeah, well that was it. Eighteen years, well that's about, I was about twenty by then. So, after four years now, I realised that it was probably time to think of going metropolitan if I was going to make progress in my broadcasting career. So I went down to Brisbane and saw the people at 4BK, 4AK, two stations, one in Brisbane, one on the Darling Downs at Toowoomba, owned by the Courier Mail, the newspaper, and there I read a little bit of news for them, did a little bit of record announcing, and they said, yeah, OK, you can have the afternoon shift. I went back to Bundaberg, resigned, sent my gear down by road, 
had travelled to Brisbane on my Lambretta motor scooter. <laughs> Don't ever do it. I bought the Lambretta because motor cars were costing money the way they do. Second hand cars can cost, so I got a, a Lambretta brand new. But do not ride one, a distance like that, a one off adventure. But I did it safely, thank goodness. And so began my career at 4BK, doing the late afternoon and early evening program. And wouldn't you know, after a little while they said, David, we're going to move Howard from the breakfast program, we'd like you to do that. Oh, here I am getting up at Sparrows again to go to the studio, but it was good. They had a van driven by a, an obliging young man who would pick up the engineer, the panel operator, who played my records so that I could concentrate on what I was saying, and me. So that we were all at the station by five o'clock, ready to start the day. So it was good. And uh, I stayed there doing that until um, another phone call. But in the meantime, on Friday mornings, into the 4BK auditorium, a big area, came the housewives of Brisbane for the housewives set parade. The ladies came in and sang the eight top tunes of the week. It was wonderful. The, the enthusiasm there, they just loved to do it. You know, where people enjoy singing. There are people who enjoy singing and yet the others are people who haven't sung yet. That's the way I think about it. And so it was about the time that Elvis Presley had discovered that great Al Jolson song, Are You Lonesome Tonight? And they sang that with such spirit and vigour. It was lovely. Then I saw a job advertised for somebody to work with the ABC children's session with Jimmy and Mac and Sue and all of those people. And of course they then became the Argonauts with Jason and his merry crew. So they came up from Sydney, they interviewed me. I didn't get the job, which is just as well because they are required to do some acting in that program and I can't act. I'm yeah. always David. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Have we got any Argonauts here? No, no Argonauts. Shame. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there it was. Spent my youth with the ear right next to the big speaker listening to the Argonauts. And, uh, yeah. and didn't join. Didn't join. Well, it was broadcast 5 o'clock on the uh, ABC network in, maybe here it would have been 6WN, the regional stations, the shortwave stations, which no longer exist, and through the School of the Air, the children, even in the remotest, remotest parts, could be part of the children's session. Anyway, didn't get the job, but the man in charge of announcers in Brisbane said, I see you've done a deal of announcing, David. I've made an audition appointment for you next week. So I accepted that, went along and did the audition, and they offered me a job. The lowest rung of the ladder. <laughs> Temporary grade one. But I took it because I was optimistic. Well, can you imagine the steep learning curve? Here's a kid who left school at 15, and all of a sudden, not only announcing the ABC's light network, but on the serious classical network as well. We didn't have ABC Classic FM then, it was just th that network and that network. And it required me to be able to say the names of some incredible composers and the names of some incredible performers and uh, say, say it with confidence because that's very important. It's no good stumbling through uh, Shostakovich. Uh, Shosta, uh, that's not good enough, is it? No. Or be like that person who was so keen about that and said, um, how do I say that? Shostakovich. Oh, yeah, that's right. And so he announced with all con now we're going to hear the Shostakovich work, the bum of the flight will be. <laughs> <laughs> so those things can happen, but not to me. However, there was a music by Zoltan Kadai, a well-known Hungarian, and I asked one of my colleagues in Brisbane, how do I say this? And he gave me a very vulgar pronunciation, which was so vulgar I didn't accept it, and I went and sought some advice from someone else who uh, told me how to say Harry Janos sweet. If you use your imagination, you can see where he might have taken me. So, during the television news one night in Brisbane, I was reading a story about yachting and boats and talked about the boatswain at the forecastle 
Oh dear. After the bulletin, a lovely man, that some of you, if you're from the East, might know of, Russ Tyson, who did the breakfast session and the hospital half hour for everyone except WA, where John Juan, of course, was the man. Anyway, Russ was in to do his little half hour television program that day, and he said to me, David, I think you'll find it's Boson and Folksall. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> I wonder why they don't spell it like that in the script. <laughs> and he said, well, that's a good point. You might like to take it up with the news editor. I didn't, of course, being a 25-year-old kid. I didn't take it up with the news editor. I just started looking things up more carefully and more frequently, finding out, getting it right. It's so important because once you get it wrong, you've lost people's belief in you as an effective conduit to convey information. One of the loveliest things that happened during my time at the ABC in Brisbane was the first time we showed the film Genevieve. You know that oh, splendid old motor car? Well, it was no longer Brighton and London and all of that. Genevieve now lived on the Queensland Gold Coast at Giltrap's Auto Museum. And they brought it up to Brisbane and I drove Genevieve around the studio to promote the film that we were going to show soon. And it was a real thrill driving Genevieve. One of my colleagues, Jeanette Delmodis, put on this huge cartwheel hat, secured it with the scarf, of course, you know, it might be a bit windy, and uh, we, we drove around while they played that theme. You remember it? <laughs> so that was a lovely thing, and lots of nice things happened at the ABC in Brisbane, until I got that phone call from Channel 7 in Brisbane. They said, David, our chief newsreader, Ron's leaving to go and sell Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd like you to come and be our chief newsreader. So I said, right, hey. Uh, and they said, we'd also like you to do a, your own variety show, a one-hour tonight show type thing. And I said, OK, that's, uh, that sounds good. I, so I resigned from the ABC, thanked them for having such a good time there and having taught me so much, and uh, moved to Channel 7 up on Mount Cooper where the studios and the transmitter are, overlooking Brisbane. So I read the news five nights a week and did the Hawks Hour. That was what they decided to call my show. And uh, in it, there were some fabulous guests. It was the time of Johnny O'Keefe. Oh, Mr. Farnham was still called Johnny then too. I hadn't become John. Little Paddy came up from Sydney. The Four Kinsmen, the, uh, um, the Deltones. People of that nature came up. I wrote some comedy and it was acted for me by Barry Otto, that fine Australian actor, and his wife, of course, Miranda's doing very well. And uh, they acted the comedy, not Miranda, she was the, wasn't even born then, but um, there was uh, Barry and his wife at the time, Ainsley. And it was really good. And we, when people weren't coming, I flew to Sydney and videoed or filmed interviews with them. Uh, they included Hugh Lloyd, Remember Hugh Lloyd? He was one of Hancock's half hour when Tony moved from radio to television. Hugh Lloyd. And we have a lovely yarn and on there he tells me his favourite clean story. He also, of course, had his own television show, Hugh and I, with Terry Scott and Hugh Lloyd. I also talked to Alfred Marks, that fine English actor with a very deep voice. And uh, I said to him now, Mr. Marks, do not call me that. I, do, I have a thing about that. Call me Alfred or Sir. <laughs> so I called him Alfred and gave him permission to call me David. And we had a lovely yarn and he talks on here about what might happen to a television program once it's been made and leaves the studio and is being transmitted. It's a lovely thing that he does. And one of the highlights of that trip to Sydney was to meet and interview Robert Goulet. The original Lancelot on Broadway in Camelot with Richard Burton, Julie Andrews and uh, you couldn't meet a nicer man, a wonderful singer, great performer and yet no tickets on himself at all. We have a lovely yarn and uh, I'm just so pleased with the interview that I have there with him when he, uh, he talks about things, he sings a little bit for me and, and then he tells me about a diamond that Burton bought for Elizabeth Taylor that made an appearance on the Ed Sullivan show. And he said, gosh, he said, fancy putting a diamond on television. You can't do anything. And we also talked about nudity on stage and agreed that it was best to keep 
ourselves covered. So <laughs> there we are. And he's a lovely man, and I'm so sad that he, uh, he lost the fight with, with life much too soon. So there's some of the people that I had the joy of talking to and interviewing and meeting. Every radio and television station has a departure lounge. And one day the departure lounge at Channel 7 in Brisbane had the general manager, the news editor, one of the cine cameramen, one of the production staff and a certain newsreader all there waiting to move out. Um, they wanted a new look for the news, they were moving it to a different time and it was not to be with me. So you accept these things and move on. I flew down to Sydney, leaving my family in Brisbane while I sorted things out, a source of income, did some daytime work reading the news for Channel 9 and then on evenings I worked at 2GB with Ann Deverson and the Reverend Roger Bush, interesting people. And there I, um, pardon me, there in the 2GB building I thought a lot of the man that I admired most on radio, the great Jack Davey. <laughs> Hi ho everybody, Jack Davey. And of course he'd long gone, he died in 1959. The here I am in 1970, so it's only 11 years later and I'm thinking of Jack a lot of the time when I'm in that building and remembering him with a great deal of affection. Okay, about this time the ABC said, why don't you come back? And I said, okay, yeah, thanks, why don't I? <laughs> well, and they said, well, where would you like to go? And I said, well, I don't think you go back. I won't go back to Brisbane. I said, how about, do you know I've never heard a bad word about Perth? I'll go to Perth for a year. And they said, right, oh, that was 1971. <laughs> Why would you leave? <laughs> I just love it so much here and I've had so many wonderful things happen. And in my early days there I was doing the morning program uh, from half past nine until uh, one o'clock and uh, enjoying doing that and meeting some interesting people including Alfred Marx who embarrassed me greatly and if you have a listen to this you'll know why but I'm not going to tell you now because you're too shy and sensitive to hear what he said to me but there it was. Um, Sylvia, Sylvia Sims was with us at the time. So I did some lovely things with the West Australian Symphony Orchestra and my good mate David Meesham. We had the game show Fair Go, the cooking program Two for the Pot with my dear friend Liz Smith, which is on there giving me instructions about getting some eggs ready for Easter. She's very good at giving instructions, is my friend Liz. <laughs> anyway, she still gives them to me from time to time. And uh, it was a lovely time and uh, I was very, very privileged to do it. I went overseas in 1978 for a little, bit of, um, a little bit of a look at Europe and while I was there the news came that Coronation Street was going back on Australian television and the mob were looking for someone to do some interviews. So I got the train as a guest up to Manchester and found Coronation Street which is tiny little railway siding underneath the railway line, this little siding and there was the, the cast and there was the Rovers return and there was Violet Carson, also known as... Yes, Come on, test your memories. Ina, Ina Sharples. Ina. Yeah. Anyway, we had a great yarn, Violet and I, and she's a lovely, well, she was a lovely, lovely woman with a great love of radio. She's worked so long in television with a great love of radio. So she's there. I came back and I got a call from 6PR. They said, Tony Barber's gone to do The Price is Right. Uh, will you come and do the morning program, 8.30 till midday? There's some money and a car. No one had ever offered me a car before, so I said, right oh. So I left the ABC. I was feeling a little bit restless anyway and went to 6PR. And there I was privileged to meet some wonderful people. Into my studio one day came... Edward Woodward and Michelle Detrice. Edward Woodward, Callum, of course, and later on he was. Come on. The the walk. Breaker. Breaker Morant. Morant, yeah, who was shot by the British because he carried out their orders. Yeah. Anyway, there he was, and they he brought Michelle Detrice with him. Bay from Some Mothers Do Have Them. And the daughter, of course, of Roy Detrice who travels around telling wonderful stories. I've got some of his yarns on there. The cleaner ones, don't worry. She observes the fact that she spends a lot of her life apologising for her father's dirty jokes. 
Anyway, they came to do Noel Coward show, Private Lines. Wonderful, wonderful play. Uh, I think one of the finest. I discovered Coward on 78 12-inch discs at, at Taree, and I loved it. And then I listened, when I listened to the balcony scene, what are you doing here? I'm on my honeymoon, so am I. Very interesting, and all that. I, so I asked Michelle, can I do some of this with you? And there's an endeavour there, and they laugh because I can't act. So they laugh at me, Edward and Michelle, but not in an unkind way, just in an amused way. Uh, and we talked about all sorts of things. And then we talked about a musical. Noel Coward adapted his play Blythe Spirit, which involves a woman coming back from, seemingly from the dead, and giving them a rough time. And he, he made a musical called High Spirits, and Coward himself directed the play. And Edward starred in this, and confessed to me that um, sometimes songs and he and the words part company. This thing about songs, I, for some extraordinary reason, I find it very difficult to learn songs and difficult to learn poetry, which is curious being an actor and spending a lot of time doing Shakespeare, you know. Mm. And one night I went on stage, uh, he only wrote one song, and so he directed the play. The, the musical, but he only wrote one song for it, and it was a very simple little English, an old English, based on an old English folk song. And it was a duet between myself and the girl who played Ruth. And it was the one, the one night that he was in, and there was a little song called If I Gave You Fields of Clover, and uh, it, it, it goes, If I gave you fields of clover, beds of flowers pink and blue, I would cross the highest mountain, darling, just to be with you. And then in came the girl, and then we sang together. And this particular night, uh, I sang, if I gave you fields of clover, beds of flowers, pink and blue, was me grass, ich bin so sand, und das war eine graue Stunde so, ich wann's wie ein Spaß. And I went into the early journey, and she peed herself, <laughs> and walked off the stage. Can I be with Betty for a moment? Oh, well, you don't really want to, do you, David? I mean, no, it's, it's, it's very embarrassing, really, you know. I get into terrible spots, you know, when they... Have you seen Miss Bottom this morning? That's great, because she just found her voice for Amanda. Oh, shut up! Good idea, Callum, for a moment. Just wash your hands. You don't be careful, mate. You'll probably find a bunch of farms right up your hooter. Uh, yeah, don't, don't interrupt when I'm speaking, you know. I mean, you know, you, you, you bleed murder out there, you're all the same. You stand there like little, little dirty tin cards, don't you? <laughs> Stay in there with your snippet into your little, your little bloom thing at the end of your microphone, man. I mean, I've met you two us before, you know. You're bloody Australians. Oh dear, a lot of fun we had. You can hear it on there. And uh, another one who died much too soon. A real talent and... Uh, He's gone to their big broadcast in the sky as well. Probably can remember the words of things now, bless him. <laughs> Edward Woodward and Michelle Detrice, what a joy it was to meet them. Another day on the end of the telephone, because he wasn't in Perth when I needed to talk to him, he was in Sydney Airport, was the very talented David Attenborough. What do you the course of filming live on Earth gave you the greatest surprise? Sitting by 
my fire, nice warm, with a good book and a glass of something or other. What am I doing here? Oh, we had a lovely time talking to each other and um, we talked about, you know, what was ahead and uh, he said, well, the earth is covered two-thirds in water. We haven't started to explore that. Well, he has since then done a wonderful series on life under the sea. I sent a fax to something I found on Google asking permission from David Attenborough to use the interview. That came... The handwritten note. Dear David Hawkes, thank you for your letter asking for permission to include an interview with me in your three CD set. Perhaps you'd be kind enough to send me a copy of the recording so that I can listen to it and know what you have in mind. Yours sincerely, David Attenborough. So I sent him a CD of it and back came, Dear David Hawkes, thank you for sending me the, the CD. You have my permission to use the extract concerned in this way. Best wishes, David Attenborough. <laughs> Lovely, from his own home and handwritten. And that's great. When he was coming to Perth last year, it put off a bit because of a bit of ticker trouble, I, I wrote to him and reminded him that our interview ended with an invitation when he was back in Perth for us to have coffee and a chat. And back came the third note. <laughs> Dear David, I'm no longer David Hawkes, I'm David. Thank you for your letter. It's kind of you to invite me to coffee when we get to Perth, but in fact my diary's already full. Thank you nonetheless. Best wishes, David Attenborough. So I treasure these, and uh, I had a rare jaw-dropping moment with my grandson Nicholas when he found out that David Attenborough was corresponding with his grandfather. <laughs> oh, he was really, really moved by that, bless him. <laughs> it was great. What have I lost there? Something. I'll find it. Don't you worry about that. Anyway, um, this is on Valentine's Day, 1980, into my studio came Malcolm Fraser, the Prime Minister. I'd like to thank you for the chance to speak with you. Yes, then uh, I'm sorry to distract you by putting on the tiara, also called the headband, but um, somebody has a special reading for you today. Ah. spirited discussion about his hope that our athletes would boycott the Moscow Olympic Games and I sort of suggested well you want the athletes to do that Mr Fraser while we continue to trade with the USSR while we continue to sell them things and we profit by them but you want our athletes to be the ones and uh, so listeners then phoned in because Talkback Radio of course is great and uh, they gave him various points and it's good. Our mob went to Moscow and acquitted themselves very well and that was good. Also on there I've got that full interview with Malcolm Fraser but also I talked to his Defence Minister Jim Killen who's uh, a bit fulsome you'll hear and then I talked to Gough Whitlam and later to Bill Hayden. When I sought Bill Hayden's permission uh, his office in Brisbane sent back his reply Yes, go ahead. I'm flattered to be remembered. <laughs> <laughs> so, party politics aside, I have no doubt that everybody's favourite Prime Minister is Jim Hacker from Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, also known as Paul Eddington. He came to Perth to star in the production of HMS Pinafore. 
at that unlikely venue, the Perth Concert Hall, which is not uh, really what they do musicals in, but there it was, and it was a lovely production. Um, Paul Eddington was great, very busy, but he found time one Sunday night to come to my studio, because I'm back at the ABC by now, and uh, we had a lovely yarn. He told me about his choice of music, he told me about his career. We talked a lot about the good life. Do you remember the good life? <laughs> there, with living next door to Tom and Barbara, mm -hmm. who were going to be self-sufficient and everything, while uh, in the middle of Surbiton with Margot and um, what was Paul Eddington's character's name? Penelope Keith. Yes. Yeah, Penelope Keith is Margot, and he was doesn't matter. Anyway, he talks a lot about the fun of working in a show like that Jimmy. with a live audience and if you fluff your lines and you've got to do them again and you've got the audience there and everything and then we, uh, and then we got to talk about what really happened to him once Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister took off. It must be an extraordinary experience to come so far and find so many people who know you. Well, I don't seem to be able to go anywhere without being pounced off the fifth because we sell our program to 47 overseas countries. And it's my impression that those who don't buy it steal it. <laughs> <laughs> and those 40 countries cannot all be English speaking. Oh, by no means. No, no, no. All the Scandinavian countries. Uh, Colonel Gaddafi is a big fan. The Chinese, the Communist Chinese, well, the 47th country to buy it with 190 million viewers. I don't know how many is it. But uh, they dub it, do they? They put other voices in for you and your friends? I think they probably have subtitles. I don't know. Maybe, maybe in China they have side titles. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't yet seen it transmitted in a foreign speaking land? No, I haven't, no. I haven't quite an experience. Talking about the early days of Paul Eddington's career and uh, some times when the larder seemed to be fairly bare. Yes. And it must be very worrying for an actor. And I wonder, in fact, how you survive waiting for the next booking. Well, on the wing and a prayer. I've never done any other job since I, since I became an actor when I was 17. So I just held my breath and hung on. It must be some form of mental torture, not only for you, but for your family. Is Dad going to work soon? Well, that's true, and, and of course, as a family man, one feels responsible. I was at a party one night when I was in a repertory theatre, and a man said, What is it like to be an actor? And I said, Oh, it's terrible. I'd really rather put it on, you know. I said, It's awful, you know, the strain of the artistic life and so on. He said, Why not come to us? Good heavens, what does he mean? And he turned out to be the representative of a petrol company. <laughs> and they wanted, they wanted salesmen to go around with petrol. So people who could speak good English and uh, sell petrol or keep up public relations or have a night. I think it was 20 pounds a week and a car to start with, which was an awful lot of money in those days. Mm -hmm. And I said to my wife, oh, what do you think? Shall I do this, do you think? And she said, well, I don't know. I, I think you've got talent, you know, she said. I, I don't think you ought to leave the profession. In fact, if you do, she said, I will leave you. Well, that's fairly unequivocal, isn't it? <laughs> I'll leave you. I wrote to his widow to seek permission and I was delighted to receive another handwritten note which I put here. Dear David Hawkes, thank you for your recent letter. I'm sorry to not have replied sooner. I've been on holidays. Of course, I'm happy for you to have permission to use the interview my husband gave you in Perth. We both enjoyed our time in Australia. I send best wishes for your success with your CD. Yours sincerely, Patricia Eddington. Lovely, another collectible. <coughs> Pardon me. And I love the address. Oh, the English know how to name things. Branley Cottage, The Street, Little Waldingfield in Suffolk. There's another bit. Oh, marvellous. So I, I treasure this. I only bring copies with me. The originals are at home, safe and sound. Okay, now, I'm at 6PR still now. We've done a little back walk, and uh, I've decided to go and get some interviews with people. 
In fact, my midlife crisis, which happened when I was about 40, meant that uh, at 6PR they said, right, you, you're going to go on the bench, you're going to do some different work, you're going to do something called state, looking statewide, sponsored by Clean Heat Gas, to go on all the country stations and 6PR, and uh, John Fry is going to do the morning program instead of you, 8.30 till midday. And, uh, you know, it was, it was time for me to just have this little time for recuperation from all that was going on in my private life. And so I went to Sydney and caught up with some interesting people. One of them was the lovely Perth actress, Judy Davis. And we had a lovely talk at her flat in Paddington, or Terrace House, where Paddington is, and um, she'd just received two BAFTAs, the English equivalent of the Oscars, um, for Best Newcomer and Best Actress anyway for my brilliant career. And we had a lovely yarn, and she wasn't too brittle with me the way that she can be, and so it was a nice time. And then a couple of suburbs away, I encountered one of the singers who made such a, a good success during the 60s and 70s. Her name is Judy Stone. Thank you very much, David. You're looking so well, and here we are in your place in Sydney. Yes. And since I last spoke to you, the big trip came about. You went off to Nashville, Tennessee. I'm so disappointed that you didn't get my card. The day it was absolutely fantastic, but I am disappointed you didn't get my card. Because I fell in love with Nashville, I remember talking to you about it and telling you how anxious I was to be there, and I loved it. I absolutely fell in love with it. What was the highlight of your Nashville trip? Well, I met Dolly Parton, and she said to me, if you had a hit record, you should really stick your chest out and be proud of it. She, she was stick her chest out further than me. But, and uh, let me see, there's a lot of people that I used to admire when I was growing up. People like Hank Snow, Marty Robbins, and also I met Charlie Daniels, Loretta Lynn. Well, have you met some of these legendary people? Are you tempted to want to work and live in Nashville? I'd love to work over there, David. I did a couple of shows over there. Judy Stone, yeah, a great talent, and um, she lived at Granville in Sydney, and she would be introduced on various t television programs as the cowgirl from Granville, until one on bandstand, someone unfortunately introduced her as the call girl from Granville, <laughs> <laughs> but she survived that. <laughs> no, she's a lovely talent, Judy Stone. I was having dinner while the Sydney trip was on, and over at that table at the Siebel townhouse, I saw a very familiar face. So I asked for pen and paper, being a polite gentleman, and wrote a little note introducing myself and saying this and that, sent it over to him. He materialised at my table within minutes. Well, hello! One of the stars of Hancock's Half Hour and on the radio days. So I arranged to interview him and Bill Kerr, another of the stars of Hancock's Half Hour, the very next day. It was a wonderful time. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Kerr, how do you do? And Kenneth Williams. Hello. 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 Nice to be here, I must say. He hasn't changed one iota since he was 12 years of age. <laughs> I might add, he still has eyes, teeth and hair. Yes, and I remember everything. I told you that line that Hancock had to say when he was on the dance floor, you remember? That's right. When I got on there, my feet began to like helicopter blades. Um, and I always remember that. And I always remember your cracks about her having the pudding. Because she had to say to Hattie Jakes, are you serving the cabinet pudding on the spotted dick? You're like a pale fool. And she was saying, really? I didn't make this bit for because it was supposed to be, you know, she was supposed to resent it. And she said, I, I don't, I don't eat a lot. I eat very but I eat like a bird. And he said, yeah, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the cracks that always made, because she was quite large, wasn't she? Uh, a large lady. Oh, what a privilege it was to meet Kenneth Williams. Knowing him from the radio days of Hancock's Half Hour with Hattie Jakes, Bill Kerr, Sid James, and of course, Anthony Hancock, and then watching him in all those Carry On films. I think the first of them was Carry On Nurse, and I think that was one of the best too. But then Carry On Doctor and Carry On This and Carry On That. And then of course, a couple of more radio shows that he was involved with, Round the Horn and Beyond Our Ken. So what a joy it was to meet him. And uh, he talked with great affection and love about Shakespeare. And I just sat and listened while this comic man talked with such confidence about the works of William Shakespeare. It truly was an enlightening experience. 
So here's another one who's up there these days, Kenneth. He fell a little bit ill. They told him he had something, and so he decided that uh, it would be best if he didn't breathe tomorrow and took his own life, which makes me very sad. But he says some wonderful things, such as, uh, he said, I'm so mean, he says, mean, I've got a padlock on me dustbin. <laughs> oh dear, wonderful, wonderful talent. Okay, now, I'm going to test you to see if you can remember some music. One day into my 6PR studio came an irascible scallywag, a mature man, a composer, a fine bassoon player who many, 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 many years ago had been with the WA Symphony Orchestra before he went elsewhere. And uh, his name is George Dreyfus. And George wrote this music. You remember it? and uh, he was delighted to hear from me and he ran a competition in competition with Gough Whitlam search for the new national anthem and he said you know all of my things were much better than Advance Australia Fair I he said I should have won that he was not a modest man George <laughs> but a fun man and uh, so that was good all right so I want you to now remember something else. I'll have a quick look here to remind me of where I'm going next. I'm going to the Regal Theatre for a production of Not Now Darling, which starred the moustached one, Mr. Phillips. You know that Mr. Phillips. Do I have to look at this to remind myself of his first name? Obviously I do. Leslie. You know, Leslie Phillips, the actor, a bit of a ladies' man, so they say. And um, with him in Not Now Darling was Andrew Sachs, better known as Manuel from Forty Towers. Oh, yeah. And uh, we had a yarn about, I talked to Leslie Phillips a lot, and we had a good talk, and I want to share a little bit of what we talked about when I talked to Manuel, or Andrew Sachs. And coming to Australia, where he's already so well known, it's the reason that I came to um, Australia in the first place. I mean, without that, well, I probably wouldn't have been here. I wouldn't have missed this, really. Yeah, I don't consider these taken over. It's all very uh, separate from me. Um, I'm not often recognised in the street or anything like that. And when I appear in other shows, it's, uh, I don't normally look like Manuel. So it's, it's very separate. I do other things. I write as well. And I do a lot of radio and film commentaries and things. So it doesn't really, what's the word, mix. He talks about the family having to leave Germany when all of the nonsense was going on in the 30s and his family fled to England and uh, they became part of the scene there to get away from Nazi Germany. And somebody befriended him and uh, he tells the story of um, another one in the profession who uh, brought him a book about some of the hideousness of what had gone on in Nazi Germany. So, Andrew Sachs, it was a, a privilege to meet Manuel and uh, I'm just delighted I had the chance. We'll make a lot of fuss about 50 years of Doctor Who recently. And who were the various doctors? Right from the start, right up to my grandsons, Nicholas and Timothy, can tell me the actors who played Doctor Who from 
50 years ago up until now and I sit there admiring it and then I tell them I've met one of the Doctor Who's I've had the joy of talking to Peter Peter Davison you might have seen him a few years a few months ago in one of the Death in Paradise stories which I enjoyed very much they were making a film and he was there at a typewriter writing the script well that's Peter Davison you saw him on television a couple of years ago as the last detective working with a lot of lazy beggars in an office and he was the only cop who actually did any work and uh, but back in well when he was a kid he was watching Doctor Who and I wondered what it was like for him as a boy watching Doctor Who <laughs> and put the first episode of Doctor Who to air. I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> Things have changed, of course. Looking back, it's easy to remember that it was a small budget program done on a shoestring, virtually, in a studio. Um, but he couldn't come to the studio, he was too busy, so we had that yarn on the telephone. The quality is always interesting on the telephone broadcast, but uh, there we are, we had a, a good yarn about it all. In 1987, I'd come back to the ABC from the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts. I had the joy of setting up in 1984, 30 years ago, I can't believe it, the Media Performance Department there. And that wasn't bad for a kid who left school at 15, setting up a department at a tertiary institution. I was a bit chuffed with myself, of course. Anyway, the media performance. To bring on the radio and television newsreaders, broadcasters, disc jockeys, journalists for the next generation. And uh, some of the graduates, uh, you see them from time to time. Priya Viswalingam, you've seen on SBS, A Fork in the Road. Uh, you've seen... Um, others that, uh, whose names don't immediately come to mind because I'm old and silly but you know I accept that, you know, I'm old and silly but uh, I went to Whopper three years and then I decided I'd rather do it than teach it and once again return to the ABC. I first left them in 69, again in 79 so in 1989 and 1999 I sat very still and just <laughs> behaved myself and didn't leave the ABC, it was good. So, 87, I'm in there, back at the ABC, and one Sunday night into the studio came a pair of newlyweds who uh, were here to do a wonderful show, The Real Thing. Their names, Dennis Waterman, from these days, New Tricks, and in the repeat last night, or the other night, I see the Jacks quitting, and, uh, and with him was his wife, Rula Lenska, one of the little ladies in the Rock Follies. At this moment they're holding hands. <laughs> it's rather nice to watch. One fortnight after the nuptials in the Jets of Shenton Park and Rilla Lenser and Dennis Waterman on this Sunday evening sharing their music with you on 6WF and giving us all sorts of peaks at uh, the hazards of their relationship over the last few years. Everything resolved now. I begin to understand perhaps why you had private investigator from Dyer's <laughs> Road. Let's come back to your next choice, Dennis. Um, it's Paul McCartney uh, singing Maybe I'm Amazed. I just love this song. I think it's a wonderful love song. I have never heard of it. Have you not? It's oh, uh, I've never heard of it. I was going to do a very good version too. Um, but I'm one of those idiots that I was like the first one I hear. and. Uh, I just love this song. I think it's nice. You ought to hear it. I think you'll like it. I'm about to. Good boy. <laughs> you obviously enjoy your music. It's obviously a very important part of your life because you're joining in here. Dennis is playing guitar. You're on the piano. <laughs> you're both doing vocals. And, and you know them and love them. 
which is an obvious sign of music being a very important part of your daily life. Yes, it is. And there's very, very seldom that there isn't something blasting out at home. And certainly here, now that the children are gone, all we have the tapes and the radio up full blast all the time. I've always loved having music around the house. It was rude against his knee. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I suspect that perhaps like, uh, like some of us, the television goes on to watch programs rather than as background and it's the radio and the record player and the tape deck that supply your background. Yes, that right? yes. Yeah. Dennis and Rula, thank you very much for sharing your music and your stories and yourselves tonight with 6WF. It's been a great pleasure. I'll just scrape myself off the carpet. It's <laughs> <laughs> brought an awful lot of memories flooding back. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I thought we'd finish on a high note with this one. It's inevitable, you know. You know what it is? I bet I do. Okay, it's one of my favourites. <laughs> By 1995, when Dennis came back to do Geoffrey Bernard is Unwell, a play about an English newspaper columnist who, when he has too much of the singing syrup, doesn't go to work and they just run a little thing. Geoffrey Bernard is Unwell. And there was a stage play written for that, and, Je and uh, Dennis came to do it here. By this time, the marriage is over, and uh, he's on his own, and he's such a different man. It was... It was I was... That, 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 that second interview is on there as well as the first interview and I'm just so disappointed uh, for him and uh, he was playing Geoffrey Bernard the role was created in the West End by Peter O'Toole and I said to, Jeff, uh, to him I said Peter O'Toole of course and I said he's now sober and happy and Dennis looked at me and said I don't know that he's happy <laughs> but he was sober at that time Peter O'Toole James Bolden also played the role the Jack I mentioned the other day, or the other bit uh, from New Tricks, who quit in the show, the repeat the other night. Um, he also played Geoffrey Bernard. I bought recently the series The Likely Lads with a very young James Bolan. Mm. <laughs> Susan Jameson crops up in the first episode, and of course she's his real life wife and plays Brian Lane's wife in new tricks. So it's all very interesting to see people when they're young and, and, and their careers are starting to take off. Anyway, um, I believe, I, I was reading something on the internet the other day that apparently Dennis was stupid enough to hit Ruler and she said, no, that's not on, and packed and left. He wasn't a wife beater as such, but something just got to him and he hit her. And, uh, and she didn't take it, so that's very sad. He's a bit like Jerry, his character in New Tricks. He's a bit of a, he's a, bit of a playboy. But we had a good time talking together. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Have you got any questions that I might be able to answer for you? Uh, Why don't I put my hearing aids in? <laughs> Otherwise I won't hear them. <laughs> As you know, blue is for the, right, the left ear. Red is for the right ear. Red is right. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, did I have any session with the man in St. George's Sheriff when you came out? No, it wasn't. It was in Adelaide. Adelaide Terrace. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, sorry, yes, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Of course, it was up in Terrace Burgess in the Supreme Court Gardens. That's where I was going to say. I went there as a, uh, about a 10 year old yeah. and, uh, of course, uh, laughed. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. I came down and sat down for a fortnight with the YFA, the young Australian ladies, and had a fortnight uh, before I went back to the high school back in that northern. So that was the time I was in the third time, ladies, and the young Australian ladies. I think it's still there in Murray Street. Yeah, still there. And they got the best day. That was about six months ago when I went past.
your stomach goes, why didn't you come to me? <laughs> you have to wait for the answer. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, David. Yeah, and any, any more like questions, you can talk with David individually while we're having a cup of tea, so there's a lot of social things that are going on. Look, it's been a great privilege to listen to you. And the memories you brought back to us. Um, there's no obligation, but if you would like the three D C D set that contains so much more, Warren Mitchell's there, never call him Alf Gardens. Lots of other people are there, Angela Punch McGregor, the original Sarah and Thomas from upstairs downstairs. We got the kids to come and have a yarn. Paul Lett and John. And all sorts of people. Henry Zett, the, the son in the other son, and mother and son. You know, hundreds of them. Dozens. So if you'd like to copy for $20, it'll be my privilege. Thank you. My pleasure. David, I'd like to present you. And as I say, it's just been a buzz to have you here. Um, your voice I can remember from, and everybody else can, and to hear it in person, it just fills in so much of our lives as well. So thank you for sharing your mind. Thank you very much for being here. And let's have a couple of the talk. So don't be before we go. Let's draw the raffle. Oh, so get your raffle tickets out. Um, tonight, because David's taken our box of chocolates, if you win the raffle, you've only got a choice of white or red. So, um, you can see you take out this here, I'll give you the chocolates. David, I'll give you two. Um, dig deep. Dig deep. Dig deep. You can sell a lot of tickets. Oh. Count the first one. First one? There you go. I can't see it without... Oh, that's fine. Yeah, down, please. It's a uh, red E ticket and it's number 040. Red E... Red E 040. Red E! And she is red E. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a 70 years ago, so you 